Hello everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, How to Get the Most Out of Orbis Micro XRF Measurements with Multiple Acquisition Conditions. Before we begin, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your audience console are several application widgets you can use. If you have any questions, you can click on the Q&A widget and submit your question. We'll try to answer these during the webinar, but if a fuller answer is needed or we run out of time, you'll get an answer later via email. We do capture all questions. A copy of today's slide deck and an additional uh, link are available in the resource list widget that looks like a green folder. You can expand your slide area by clicking on the maximize icon on the top right or by dragging the bottom right corner of the slide area. If you have any technical difficulty, please click on the Help widget. It has a question mark icon and covers common technical issues. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available a few hours after we finish today, and it can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Bruce Scruggs, who is our presenter for today's webinar. Bruce is the XRF product manager at EDAX, and he has been involved with XRF for over 20 years since joining EDAX. Bruce holds an undergraduate degree in chemistry from Valparaiso University and graduate degrees in chemical engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He started out working in applications for a company which builds innovative sample handling equipment for solid state NMR. Bruce got involved in XRF when a headhunter confused RF radiation with X-ray radiation, and the rest is history. And now over to you, Bruce. Thanks very much for that introduction, Sue. Uh, good day to everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us uh, in this webinar, uh, talking about how to um, get the best out of uh, XRF measurements with multiple acquisition conditions. So what we're going to talk about today specifically is using uh, filtering in small and microspot XRF to improve the analysis of uh, trace and minor elements. Um, trace I define as below one weight percent. Minor elements I define as between one to 10 uh, weight percent. So just to give you a brief overview of what we're going to talk about, um, I'll run a little bit through the uh, X-ray fluorescence spectrometry. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail in that particular area. We have some other resources and presentations uh, available uh, for that kind of thing. Um, I'll talk about uh, what are the primary beam filters, where they're located in the system, what they do, um, how they make improvements uh, to the spectrum, what the trade-offs are. And then I'll go through a few uh, example measurements. Um, I have uh, some examples from forensic glass comparisons, uh, and then glass quantification, gemstone quantification. And from these, I hope you'll be able to see how you can extend these types of measurements to other materials, whether it's uh, geologicals or metals, metal alloys, um, that kind of thing. OK. so. This is what uh, XRF gives us in general and what small spot micro XRF is generally used for. Um, so X-ray fluorescence gives us elemental composition. This can be thought of both more in a qualitative sense uh, and in a quantitative sense. And we can do multi-layer thickness and composition uh, with XRF as well. Small spot, micro spot XRF, uh, you can analyze small fragments by concentrating your excitation down onto the small fragments. Um, you can analyze more than one fragment at a time, you know, put several fragments out onto your sample handling stage, automate the acquisition. You can look at large pieces um, and do distribution analysis uh, to determine, say, homogeneity of the elemental composition uh, of that material. And you can do elemental uh, imaging um, to get a picture of that elemental distribution. These are some of the typical things um, that we, uh, we can do with uh, XRF. Today I'm going to focus basically on how to improve the elemental composition, the qualitative and quantitative analysis. OK. 
Okay, these are some of the reasons why uh, um, analysts use uh, X-ray fluorescence. It is non-destructive. Uh, there's no beam damage from the uh, from the X-ray. Um, there's no need to coat the sample or necessarily prep the sample uh, in a certain way to do analysis. Um, so the main goal, especially in micro XRF, uh, is to analyze the samples uh, as is, and uh, so that you can preserve that either uh, to because it's uh, something for production or because you want to take it and analyze it by other methods as well. Then you can ex analyze exactly the same piece. It also covers a great deal of the uh, periodic table. We run from uh, sodium uh, on up to uh, berkelium. Analytical range, you can analyze from parts per million levels up to major elements to 100%. Um, and the x-rays are very penetrating. So your analytical volume here is determined by um, the x-ray signal that you're looking at. The lower energy uh, the X-ray signal is, the lower, the, the smaller the analytical volume, so down into the microns level. Um, if you're analyzing more energetic uh, X-ray signals from your sample, you can go up into the millimeters range uh, of the material. This is uh, one of the aspects of uh, X-ray uh, analysis that makes it very useful for coding analysis, uh, because you want to have the analytical volume be greater than the coding that you're trying to analyze. Uh, vacuum levels for this sort of analysis, hundreds of millisor, you don't need a real high vacuum. You can analyze also an atmosphere um, and on, under uh, helium atmosphere as well. Helium lets you put an atmosphere down onto liquids and look at lower energy elements. Um, analyzing in air, it's just a, a heavier medium and it scatters more of the low energy um, X-ray. Uh, and uh, navigation, taking pictures of the samples, this is done by op optical uh, microscopy. So here's the, uh, the tool that, that I've made measurements on and, and that uh, EDAX uh, produces and sells. Uh, the basic components of a system like this are off on the right-hand side. We have uh, digital uh, video microscopes and uh, LED lighting. Um, so that's what lets you view the sample. We excite the sample with a 50 kV, 50, uh, or 50 kV, 1 milliamp uh, X-ray tube. So these are 50 watt uh, sources. Um, we have some uh, filtering that is available in the systems as well. Um, we generate small spots either through reflective X-ray optics. Um, these are basically X-rays uh, reflecting inside uh, capillaries to focus the beam on down to the sample. Or we also collimate the beam uh, just with a simple pinhole through a, through a metal uh, through a metal block. These are this is energy dispersive type systems, so we're using uh, electrically active uh, detectors. The photons enter the detector, they dissociate into electrical charge, and we figure out what's the X-ray energy based on how much electrical charge there is dissociating in the detector. These are cryogen free, so they are electrically cooled systems. There's no uh, no maintenance, uh, no user maintenance involved with these. Samples are put down onto a motorized XYZ stage, so we're moving the sample underneath our measuring head. And uh, as you can see from the picture, we've got a sample chamber that can do vacuum uh, air, and uh, we can also do helium. This system weighs about 90 kilos. It's about 200 pounds. It sits on sits on a tabletop. All right, that's the tool. Quick overview of the spectroscopy. What what signal are we actually looking at when we uh, when we analyze a sample? And this is often described by looking at uh, Bohr's model for uh, for uh, the atom. We have a nucleus surrounded by a certain electron orbitals. Um, the innermost orbital is the K, L, M. As you get to heavier elements. Um, the, the orbital structure gets more complicated uh, as you go. Um, what we're doing in X-ray fluorescence is we excite with X-ray. If the X-ray has the exciting X-ray has enough energy, you eject an electron out of one of these orbitals. If you eject a, an electron out of the K line, out of the K shell, you get what we call the K line series of X-rays that come back. So 
you, you, you eject electrons out of the orbitals, you have a high energy state, and it's, it wants to relax back to a low energy state. So electrons will relax into the orbitals where, they've been, uh, where electrons have been ejected. In that relaxation process, we fluoresce x-rays that are characteristic, that give a characteristic energy of that particular element. So if we eject an electron out of the, the uh, K shell, it's a K line series. We eject it out of the L shell, it's an L line series. We eject it out of the uh, M shell, it's an M line series. So we're looking at electron transitions, fluorescing uh, X-ray, and the X-rays have characteristic energy of the element we're looking at. The heavier the element, the more complicated the electron structure, the more complicated or the, the more line series and the more transitions that you can see in the spectrum. This is a typical example of, uh, of uh, iron K series. Uh, so this is an ejection out of the, the K shell. Uh, we'll have K alpha and K beta lines. Um, within within that, those two lines, it, they look both like Gaussians, but there's a couple of other transitions inside there. Um, it's just that they're so close in energy that the resolution of our detector uh, is not, um, doesn't make a distinction between those uh, transitions. Um, so resolution is typically uh, for these systems on the order of 135, 140 uh, EV. Um, the scale here, uh, iron K alpha is at around 6.4 6 uh, kiloelectron volts. Um, as the elements get heavier, the splittings get, uh, the difference in splittings go larger and you can see more complication in the, in the K series. Um, as, you, as you look at a heavy element like lead, um, on our tabletop system, the K series is up at around 75 kV, so that's beyond our 50 kV uh, excitation source. So we look at the L-line series at that point. The L-line series is, is, um, is a characteristic uh, triplet. You have L-alpha, L-beta, L-gamma, but you can see there's some also some other transitions in there as well. It's just to give you an idea of what the line series look like and how the splittings occur and uh, how they become uh, a little bit more complicated as you go uh, to heavier elements. XRF is an atomic spectroscopy. We're looking at the presence of an atomic element. And when we talk about composition, we're looking at elemental composition. We're not looking at molecules. Okay, uh, the X-ray tube excitation. Um, the X-ray tube is basically um, an air-cooled system where we have an electron beam colliding into a metal target. Um, when you have the electrons colliding into a metal target, you can get X-ray emission. Uh, and you, you get two kinds of X-ray emission. You get the continuum, which is the Brunstrahlung, the, the slowing down of the electrons in the, in the metal target, emitting a continuous spectrum of X-ray up to the accelerating energy the electrons collided into the target with. And you also get the fluoresced lines from the metal target itself. So the electrons can go to cause X-ray fluorescence of the metal target and you'll get the characteristic lines from the metal target. Typical metal targets, rhodium, molybdenum, tungsten, chrome, silver, copper. Um, the key things there is that you want it to be something that can handle a lot of heat um, uh, because as the electrons collide into the target, you, you generate a lot of heat in the process. Okay. This is what the beam line uh, looks like uh, in an XRF, in a micro XRF system. You have the X-ray tube, you have a filter wheel. So in the filter wheel, we'll have a, a pallet of filters. A filter is simply a thin metal foil. Um, you want it as pure as, as uh, possible so that you don't get impurity uh, signals uh, or impurities in, in the filter itself. So a typical filter might be 25 microns of nickel foil, for example. After the, after the filter wheel, uh, you want the X-ray optic or the collimator because the filter wheel is a scattering element. Um, and so you want to refocus uh, the scattered element or filter out or get rid of the portion that's not focused uh, through the optic or collimator. Uh, and then you have your sample. So we will have x-rays being emitted from the, from the x-ray tube, passing through the filter. 
After the filter, we'll have the uh, filtered X-ray, which will pass into the optic or the collimator. And we will have filtered, focused, or collimated X-ray uh, impinging on the sample. So what does the filter uh, do? Uh, basically uh, to the exciting x-ray beam. Um, and here I have an example of uh, a nickel filter placed in line. And what we're looking at is the spectrum that comes off a clean uh, block of plastic. So it's, I, I don't remember what the plastic was, but it's basically carbon, hydrogen, ox uh, carbon, hydrogen, um, and oxygen, I think. Um, so these are elements below our, our detection level for this kind of a system. Um, and what we're looking at here is typically energy dispersive spectra are characterized um, on the x-axis, you have the energy of x-rays, and on the y, you'll have the intensity of the x-ray. So starting from low energy, we've got some, um, you, you have the background is knocked down because it's too low in energy to pass through the filter. Um, there's a little bit of a, an electron, uh, or sorry, an electronic uh, artifact here where you've got some shelf characteristic. But as you, as you can see, uh, as you go up to about 4 kV, um, the background uh, settles down. Um, as you increase the energy of the X-ray, basically what we're looking at here is a transmission characteristic of the filter. So the higher the energy of the X-ray, the more that's transmitted through the filter. As you go up into the 6 to uh, 8 kV range, um, this is the band pass of that particular uh, filter. Um, you can see how the filter is um, beginning to become, is becoming more transmissive to X-ray. Now, what happens right around 8.5 kV, this is the absorption edge for, that, uh, for the, the filter material itself. So this is nickel, that's the nickel absorption edge. What happens there is that the filter becomes more absorptive. The X-ray going through the filter can now excite the nickel material in the filter, and so the uh, transmission characteristic changes drastically right there, and we get a drop in the background. And as we increase in energy beyond the, uh, beyond the absorption edge, the transmission of the filter increases again. So the sensitive region for the filter is right in this uh, zone um, where you have low background but you have higher energy X-ray still available to excite elements that would show up in this uh, range. You can also use the lower energy portion of the region as well um, because you have some of the filter band pass also passing through as well as the higher energy as well um, to excite elements in that region too. So this is, this is the excitation characteristic uh, for a, a filter. Um, I'll describe for you the benefits of this, and then I'll show you um, an example of how the filter helps to improve uh, the situation over a certain region of the spectrum. So with the filters, you can reduce spectral background. The goal is to improve the overall peak to background um, for certain certain set of elements. Um, it's the peak to background that controls the sensitivity. Remember I mentioned that the tube targets, they'll also emit the, uh, the characteristic lines. These are useful for um, providing um, additional excitation um, on the sample. Um, but if you have, say, an interference, so the, the tube characteristic line is overlapping a line that you want to look at, then you'd like to have that taken out of the spectrum. Um, and you can do that with a filter. Um, also, in X-ray fluorescence, you can get Bragg diffraction reflections which are, um, uh, it's, it's, it's basically X-ray diffraction. So exciting X-ray comes and reflects off a crystal plane in the sample into the detector. I'll go on into a little bit more of that uh, when I talk about the gemstones because the gemstones are all single crystal uh, samples. And the filters are, always, are also very useful for mitigating uh, harmonic peaks um, that show up in the spectrum by suppressing the parent peaks. So what does this do? It, it improves detection limits for you, and it eliminates spectral artifacts uh, that may interfere with uh, the trace elements that you're looking at. So let's look at an example. Um, this is a piece of glass we're analyzing. Um, I have a rhodium tube, um, and in the this is an overlay here. So the red spectrum in front is the filtered spectrum. The blue outline spectrum in the background is the unfiltered excitation. 
so um, we have uh, we have the rhodiumel tube scatter, um, which is useful for exciting the lower energy elements in the glass. So that's the silicon, the aluminum, and the sodium in the range up to about uh, 2 kV that you see on the left-hand side of the spectrum. Um, what we're after in this particular case is this particular glass contains chlorine. This is uh, SRM93A from uh, NIST. And so if I put a thin filter into the system, um, I can knock out the uh, rhodium L tube scatter, and now I get a very nice spectrum of the chlorine uh, in the sample uh, underneath. Now, another characteristic um, that you might notice in the uh, unfiltered spectrum is you have this harmonic peak here. This is the silicon silicon, um, which is basically two silicon x-rays entering the detector at the exact same time. Uh, and it shows up uh, an energy of twice the original uh, energy of the silicon. Um, if I suppress the uh, silicon by putting a filter in there, I reduce the efficiency of exciting my silicon peak. So I have fewer silicon x-rays entering into the detector. And then I can uh, get rid of that harmonic peak. Uh, and you can see in the red spectrum, there is no harmonic peak um, in the red spectrum. I have my trace elements for potassium and for calcium. So the filter spectrum gives me a nice shot at the chlorine, the potassium, and the calcium. Um, the the trade-off in using the filters is that we rely on that rhodium L tube scatter to give us a very efficient excitation of the lower energy elements. Uh, so in this particular case, this glass also contains the sodium oxide. Um, and if you can see, in the blue spectrum, we have a very nice peak to background on the sodium, uh, on the sodium peak. When you go to the red spectrum, where the, uh, the rhodium tube scatter is, the tube excitation is filtered out, we don't have as efficient a uh, excitation for the sodium, and so our peak to background on that goes down. So here what I want to highlight is the, the trade-off uh, of what, what, what happens when you use with and without the filters. So we're exciting our sample in this particular case with a high intensity polycapillary optic. Um, we're getting spot sizes down in the range of 25 to 30 microns. And in the uh, right column, we're looking at the limits of detection on a glass uh, sample that we measured for about 10 minutes um, across the range of the elements in the glass. In comparison, on the left-hand side, I have put that thin aluminum filter in to eliminate the rhodium tube scatter. What this does is it gives us access to the sulfur and chlorine um, peaks that would normally fall um, in that uh, energy range as well. So I can report out some detection limits for what we get for those elements in this particular list. The trade-off is that my detection limits for the sodium, the magnesium, and the aluminum are degraded, as you can see in comparison to the uh, measurement without a filter. All right, so the idea here is to um, combine the measurements of uh, with and without the filter so that you can see some benefits from uh, both of these. So what we have on the left-hand side of the two columns are the original two measurements I showed you in the previous slide. On the right column is the results if we take the sodium to silicon uh, measurement from the uh, non-filtered uh, spectrum. Those are the detection limits we get there. And then we take the elements um, from sulfur on up to zirconium um, for the filtered spectrum. Now that spectrum on the right-hand side, or the, the detection limits on the right-hand side, sorry, are measured for 20 minutes, whereas the two spectra on the left-hand side are measured each for uh, 10 minutes. Now, you can't really reproduce the results um, for the uh, acquisition on the right-hand side by simply doubling the time um, for either one of the two spectra on the left-hand side. It, it doesn't work like that. Um, First of all, in the filtered spectrum, we were removing that rhodium tube line, and so we get rid of the interference and we have a clean measurement uh, of the sulfur and the chlorine peaks. So simply uh, 
doubling the measurement time without a filter, it's not going to give us access to that region of the spectrum um, that we would have with the filtering. Um, if we go over to the filtered uh, spectrum, simply doubling that will not give us the detection limits uh, that we see um, with the unfiltered spectrum. It's only going to improve those detection limits theoretically by about 40%. It's the square root of the, um, time, the increase in time or the, uh, yeah, the improvement in time that you're measuring. So if you improve the time or increase the time, sorry, by a factor of two, the improvement in detection limit is theoretically the square root of two. So it's, it's 1.4. Um, so that would give us a detection limit of sodium of something like nominally 3,000 parts per million, whereas you can see without the filter, we're getting in the range of a, of a limited detection of around 250 parts per million, something like that. The other factor there is that um, in, looking at the, uh, in looking at the filtered spectrum, we can also get rid of some of the small harmonic peaks uh, that will come into play there, where, for example, I showed you the example of the silicon plus the silicon. Um, so you're not going to necessarily uh, clean all of that up simply by doubling the time um, with, the, uh, with the filter. Um, all right, so the benefit of, the, of combining the results with and without a filter are that you can clean up some of these various artifacts uh, without, uh, so that you can get a clean shot at looking at the trace and the minor peaks involved. So let me show you an example, um, or let me start to, I think we're getting into some of the examples now that we're going to measure. Um, I come back to the equipment at this point just to highlight that under the optics section, I'm going to show you some, some three examples of uh, what we've done. We're going to be using high-intensity polycapillary optics in this particular case um, because, as you can imagine, when you put a filter into line, um, it's going to knock the exciting X-ray uh, energy down. So if, if you have, uh, uh, if you have a high-intensity optic, for example, that collects as much of the X-ray coming through the filter as possible, then you, can, uh, you, get, the best, uh, you get the best results. Our measurements in this particular case are with spot sizes on the order of 25 to 30 microns full with half max, um, that kind of a spot size. Okay, some uh, examples. The first example is uh, forensic glass analysis. And here I'm just kind of depicting um, a broken uh, window pane where maybe somebody broke into the, uh, broke into the house um, the reason why this is interesting is glass is a, a very good uh, form of evidence. Um, it transfers onto um, people's clothes. You can imagine it gets stuck on their shoes, on, on the clothing. It's a very durable uh, piece of evidence. It doesn't change or degrade uh, over time. Um, and it's widely used. So you can imagine uh, window glass, light bulbs, um, windshields, that kind of thing, anywhere where you have an, an accident where something would break, uh, a lamp got knocked over, they broke through a piece of glass, that kind of thing. Uh, the glass uh, transfers relatively easily. It's sharp. It gets, caught in, it gets caught in a suspect's clothing. What they want to do here is they, they go to the crime scene, they see some broken glass, they take some samples of that. That's the known source. And um, if they have a, a suspect that um, they've found some glass fragments on in the clothing and whatnot, uh, these become the question sources. And they want to make a comparison between the question fragments on the suspect's clothing and see whether they are consistent or inconsistent with what they found uh, at the crime scene. If they find that something's not consistent, then you know clearly, then that you know they they are going down the wrong path uh, with that particular suspect, and that's important to know as well. Um, glass fragment comparisons in a, in a in a forensics lab don't just rely on elemental composition. There's a whole host of uh, measurements that they make: color, refractive index, density. Elemental composition is uh, done by a variety of tools. Micro XRF is one of them. Um, inductively coupled plasma variants are another. Um, it's high sensitivity, but it's destructive. Uh, SEM EDS in general is more limited in its sensitivity. It's, it's in general not used um, in this particular case simply because of the more limited uh, sensitivity. The advantages in using the XRF for a case like this, um, it's non-destructive. 
Um, you don't have to treat the sample. Um, you don't have to break the sample or anything like that. You can measure it as is. So you can measure uh, by XRF first and, and apply it to other methods that may be destructive uh, later. So that's, that's the big benefit for measuring it by XRF. Um, in glass fragment comparisons um, in U.S. Uh, criminal forensics labs, um, they developed uh, a standard testing method uh, back in 2013. At the bottom of the slide, I show you the, uh, the method number and the title, Standard Test Method for Forensic Comparison of Glass Using Micro X-ray Fluorescence Spectrometry. Um, in this method, they are using uh, elemental ratios to make comparisons between glass fragments. And the reason why they're using ratios in a particular case like this is that the full quantity of analysis um, tended to have more imprecision in the results due to surface topography or the variation in the fragment thickness. Um, elemental ratios, if you choose those ratios where the elements are relatively close in energy, then this can help to uh, improve precision um, taking into effect, taking into account the variation in the fragment. They generally try in these particular situations when it's available to compare a question fragment and a known fragment of a similar size and, and shape to also reduce those factors as well. So um, in the data that I'm going to show you, um, I sort of put together my own simulated version of this kind of a glass comparison by looking at soda bottle glass. Um, there are similar formulations to window glass, but um, can be lower in the magnesium oxide component. This was also something that you know I could find at the grocery store. Um, if you go into in the in the in a U.S. grocery store, if you go into the international section of the store, you'll find uh, soda bottles uh, that were. Uh, bottled down in Mexico, the reason being that they are using uh, normal cane sugar as opposed to uh, high fructose corn syrup. Um, and what I did is over the years, I sort of, for some reason, I started gathering up bottles, and then I noticed I had sort of an agglomeration of these things, a collection of uh, bottles over the years and manufacturers. Um, what they will typically do is they will have fragments um, that they have compared from question to known source, um, and they'll make several measurements on each fragment and plot up the ratios. And the idea behind plotting up the ratios then and making several measurements on a fragment is to give you an idea to, to capture the variation in measurement, the precision, and all of that. Um, and you would expect two similar pieces of glass to exhibit the same uh, ratio and dissimilar pieces of glass to have ratios uh, that don't overlap in these uh, spectra, uh, in these plots. So the first example I'm going to show you is ratioing calcium to iron. Calcium is rel relatively high concentration in these types of glasses. It's around 7 to 8 weight percent. Uh, the iron oxide in these things is around, in these glasses, is around 500 to 200 to, sorry, 500 to about 2,000 parts per million. I was using an aluminum filter in this particular case. And this is what the plot looks like. Um, now, the, uh, the, the legend on the right is actually upside down. Um, this was pointed out by a paper reviewer uh, later on, and I, I never fixed it here. Um, what we have on the top line, this is uh, SRM1831. I was just kind of using this as a normalizing factor. Um, SRM1831 is a soda lime glass, which is very similar to the bottle glass in composition. There's nine measurements there. It's a nice full thickness, flat fragment, so you can see you have very little uh, spread uh, in the data. Um, we have two fragments from a Pepsi bottle uh, that I bought in 2015. Uh, you can see those two fragments uh, overlap nicely. One of the fragments gives you a lot more spread than the other one. So it gives you an idea in general of the spread that uh, can occur uh, in the measurements. Um, and we have uh, two other bottles. Uh, we have one Coke bottle, two fragments coming from uh, 2011, and another Coke bottle uh, in 2015. I don't remember where I bought them from. It's probably from completely different uh, grocery stores. Uh, 
I expect that they all come from the same bottling center uh, over the years. And you can see in the case, uh, in comparing between the Coke and the Pepsi, you have a very distinctive uh, difference uh, in the glass source itself. So you can easily distinguish between the two different manufacturers. Um, but between the manufacturers uh, over different years, you can see they have very good uh, production control over the calcium and iron uh, in there that the ratios are, are maintained over the years. So what I wanted to do then was try to figure out, well, are there other trace element sets um, that could be interesting here as well? Um, and so in this particular plot, what I was looking at was I found uh, lead using a nickel filter. So in this case, now I'm going to plot up the ratio for the iron to the lead, where the iron has been measured under the aluminum filter condition, and the lead has been measured under the nickel filtering condition. And this plot is a little bit different uh, in the sense that what I have now are three different uh, Coca-Cola Coca -Cola bottles. Um, I have three fragments from a bottle that was uh, purchased over in Europe in 2015. You can see, uh, again, we're, we're measuring about nine points on every fragment, and you can get an idea of the spread in the data here. The iron, again, is in the range of the 500 to 2,000 parts per million. The lead is actually below uh, 100 parts per million uh, in these. The lead oxide is below 100 parts per million uh, in, these, uh, in these bottles. So the German bottle probably has a little bit more uh, lead uh, oxide in it, and uh, that's probably why you have lower spread. Um, you can see they overlap nicely uh, with one another. Um, there's another bottle from Mexico, so different continent. Now I'm, I'm expecting at that particular course, at that particular point, we're looking at a totally different bottling source uh, now. So the glass is coming from two different sources. So we can get a split in between the bottle from Germany and from Mexico, uh, 2015. And here's now the same, uh, the same brand bottle again, uh, Mexico in 2011. So the two I showed you previously that were overlapping in terms of the calcium iron ratio, you can see how there's a difference in the ratios between the lead and the iron, which suggests that you know there's some measurable variation in that uh, lead oxide in the in the glass, depending on whatever the source is for the for the lead oxide. So using trace elements measured from two different filters um, gives you some very nice contrast in the same bottle brand uh, and different continents as well uh, in uh, bottle brand glasses. Okay, this would be characterized more as sort of a semi-quantitative -quanti type of example. Um, I'm going to look at uh, now full glass composition. Um, this might be useful in looking at, for example, high performance glasses. So the example I'm looking at here, these are, um, this is the glass that goes over a smartphone case. Uh, and over the years, they've tried to make this stuff um, scratch resistant and at the same time shatterproof. Uh, you can imagine there's a lot of science that goes into this type of a glass. It depends a great deal on the trace and, and minor elements uh, in the glass itself. Um, so it's interesting to quantify those trace elements uh, as that can affect the glass performance. Um, for this particular type of analysis, I was using a standalone software package that's available from EDAX. Um, it was used to import the spectra and quantify the uh, spectra under varying acquisition conditions. Now, the software has the capability to vary a variety of different things. You can vary tube current, uh, tube KV, uh, the filter condition, the background subtraction uh, conditions. Uh, in this particular case, I'm just going to focus on varying the filter conditions to see how that can improve uh, measurements for us. Okay, so um, the software itself, um, under under multiple filter conditions or under under different acquisition conditions. You need a calibration standard for each kind of a filter condition. Now, when I say calibration standard, you can start out with something simple, uh, pure elements. Um, if uh, a pure element is not stable in a particular form, you can also use compounds. So I give an example of uh, potassium carbonate. Uh, what what it will you know what it will do in a particular case like that is um, 
you don't necessarily uh, have to cover every element in the sample that you want to look at as well. You just have to have um, one kind of a one kind of a pure element or compound for each acquisition condition, and whatever elements are not uh, covered can be interpolated or extrapolated from the existing ones. Um, in this particular case, for the stuff I'm going to do, for the data and the results I'm going to show you, I was using a type standard for the glasses. Um, I use the same type standard for the gemstones as well um, because they're both uh, oxides, but it's typically not exactly a type standard in that particular case. It's more of a, it's more of something a matrix matching, but not uh, not exactly. So for the glass composition, I'm going to use SRM 1831. This is uh, available from the National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, in the U.S. It is a soda lime glass. Uh, soda lime glass is typically used for uh, window panes. Um, I also found in looking it up that they also use it for um, for bottle containers as well. Um, if you look at the NIST certificate, it's certified for the oxides that I show you here. Um, just be mindful of the fact that that's not a that list doesn't necessarily say this is all that's in the glass. Um, it's just what's been certified. There can be other trace impurities in the glass as well. Uh, and in this particular glass, there are traces of magnesium, rubidium, strontium, and zirconium as well. Um, uh, and uh, so I took uh, from the, the working group that developed that uh, forensic glass comparison analysis, they also measured the traces of the rubidium and the strontium and the zirconium in there as well. So I took some of that for this uh, work as well. So here uh, are the results for just using the SRM as a, as a calibration standard. Um, what I've done is I've measured with three filters. Uh, you can see that on the left, uh, zero is open, one is a thinner filter, two is a thicker filter. You can see the ranges of the oxide components that we cover. Uh, what I did is I used the uh, SRM 1831 as a calibration standard. Total measuring time was about five minutes. Um, and uh, then I took that spectrum just to give some idea of what was going on. I plugged it back in as an unknown. I didn't use the traces of the zirconium and the manganese for calibration, just to see, you know, what the extrapolation would, uh, the interpolation extrapolation would give us um, uh, in a case like that, um, in your best case scenario. So the traces for the zirconium and the manganese uh, run about 20 to 40 parts per million, or sorry. 20 to 60 parts per million uh, for these kinds of oxides, uh, and the quantification then is running at around 30% uh, uh, error for those. Uh, it's, it's, I think that's fairly decent for the, for the level of parts per million that we're looking at there. All right, a little bit busier slide now. These are the results now using the SRM 1831 as a calibration standard and measuring three other uh, standard glasses where I could get compositional values for these. Again, we're using the same three filtering conditions. And in the component table, the component column on the left-hand side there, all of the elements highlighted in green, um, these are elements that are not in the SRM 1831. Um, so in this particular case, we are interpolating or extrapolating calibration coefficients for these uh, for these things. Um, total measuring time on these glasses was about five minutes. I think it's parsed out as one minute without one minute measuring time without a filter, and two minutes measuring time for each of the other two filters. So total measuring time is five minutes. Um, in any given condition, it's just a couple of minutes of measuring time. Um, there are um, it looks like there's three different types of glasses. There's actually three, or more like two different types of glasses here. SRM620, um, which is uh, the, um, the first glass on the left, is a soda lime glass. So it's very similar in composition to the SRM1831. Um, we're getting errors that are along the same lines of what we saw for using the SRM1831 when we plugged it back in as an unknown. Um, in, in SRM 620, um, the, there is um, 200 to 300 parts per million of the strontium and zirconium oxides. Um, however, there's no reported values for those, and NIST isn't able to report any informa informational values for those. So I'm not sure exactly how accurate the results are for that. You can see we also have uh, 
620 also has arsenic oxide in it, and you can see we got around 10% accuracy on the amount of, uh, of the quantification for that. Um, the next glass in the list uh, in the middle, SRM93A, is a borosilicate glass. Um, this particular gas is it's, it's, it's a totally different type of glass. In this particular case, we are just inputting the amount of uh, bor uh, bor um, boron oxide in the glass. Um, so that was something we took as known. We didn't determine that, just so we could look at the trace levels. Um, the things to point out here, or the, the interesting things we were looking at here, um, the uh, SRM93A has uh, chlorine in it. Um, and so that was one thing that was extrapolated from the SRM 1831. Uh, we got into the ballpark with the number there. Um, uh, so that was around, it's around actually 600 parts per million. Um, you can see the, the levels uh, that we got for the traces of potassium and calcium. In this particular case, it's a, it's a much different uh, glass matrix at this point. You can see there's almost no calcium in there. Um, it's only a couple hundred parts per million in comparison to the seven to eight uh, weight percent that's in the soda lime glass. Um, the zirconium is a little bit uh, low. Uh, the magnesium oxide, it's a high level of air, but the thing to remember here is we're pretty much probably at the detection limits for this. The actual glass itself only has about 50 parts per million in it. Um, the reason why we get such a high number is we're, we're looking at fitting noise uh, in a particular case like this. So it's important to understand when you're making these measurements, you know, are we getting significant results based on the calculation of the intensities, which you can look at in the, in, um, in the calculation errors uh, or not. I, I left it in here um, so that so it was available to see. The last glass is a float glass. Um, this is very much, again, a float glass essentially is really referring to the process by which they make the glass. So they float it out onto a tin, uh, a molten tin bed. It's basically window glass like soda lime glass. So the composition is very much like the soda lime glass. I just didn't realize it after I put everything all together because of the different names. But it's, it's essentially a soda lime glass as well. We're getting errors that are comparable to what we were with our soda lime glass calibration. So this sort of indicates that I think SRM93A could be made better if we were using a borosilicate uh, matrix also. The one last point I'll, I'll mention about the uh, float glass, uh, in this particular case, it also has a few hundred parts per million of barium oxide. Um, uh, it does a reasonably nice job at quantifying this. The error probably associated with that, with that has more to do with trying to deconvolute the overlap between the titanium oxide and the barium oxide. So these are, in the spectrum, they're fairly heavily overlapped. Um, and uh, I, I just uh, put, this, put it in there so we can see what kind of a quantification we get. Uh, and I think it did a nice job in a particular case like this. Uh, the last example we're going to look at is gemstone composition. Um, we're going to look at some rubies and sapphires because that's uh, what the jewelry was available to me uh, to look at. Um, gemstone analysis, uh, some of the important characteristics to look at, the minor and the trace elements give you information about whether the stones are natural or synthetic. And uh, an expert can take some of those profiles as well uh, and apply that to um, sourcing where the stones were mined. Um, gemstones are a little bit uh, challenging to analyze because they are crystalline. Um, and the crystalline samples will lead to a diffraction peak. So what happens in that particular case is the exciting energy comes and reflects off of the crystal surface. If you meet the right uh, geometric condition, that energy can be reflected up uh, into the detector and it will, it will look like a, a peak. Um, so you'll get a certain interference in that particular case. You can move the gemstone around, change the geometric condition, um, and that will move the peak around. Um, I, I wanted to show an example here with the filtering because, um, because uh, that's not always guaranteed to solve your problem for you. It's more time consuming, and uh, polycrystalline, polycrystalline samples will give you more of a broader peak. So the filtering is a good way to completely get rid of the diffraction peak. Because if you remove that the exciting energy that's reflecting off the sample, then you have no diffraction peak. So let me give you an example of that. Um, 
This is uh, a uh, ruby uh, spectrum. So ruby is uh, aluminum oxide. Um, you can see the aluminum peak on the left-hand side. There's some other peaks that I've labeled that are important traces in this, titanium, vanadium, iron, gallium. Um, there's a number of other peaks in the spectrum. These are all diffraction peaks. And in this particular case, uh, the diffraction peak is falling right on top of chrome, which is the most important element in the ruby that gives it its red color. So it's important to be able to analyze for the uh, chrome peak in a particular case like this. Now, if I come in with some filtering on these, um, it's a little bit more complicated spectrum. I have two spectra here. I have uh, the red one is a natural uh, blue sapphire. The highlight, the outline blue in the background is a synthetic uh, blue sapphire. So I've used three filtering conditions here. On the, on the left, I've used no filter at all, and that's to get silicon uh, trace impurities in the stones. I have used a nickel filter, um, and I showed you an example of what its transmission was uh, previously, to give me the titanium and the, and the vanadium that are around the 4 to 5 kV range, as well as the gallium uh, in the 9 to 9.5 kV range. And then I've used an aluminum filter to give me the spectrum of the iron. Um, so what we want to do is we want to get at the elements that cause the color centers for these stones. We want to get at the elements that we expect to see for natural and synthetic. Just for, you know, for your interest, in this particular case, the main difference that's interesting uh, is that the uh, gallium is a signature for the natural stones. Um, so you can see in the blue spectrum, there's no gallium in it. It's a synthetic, uh, it's a synthetic uh, stone in this particular case. All right. So uh, in this, in this uh, measurement, um, in this set of measurements, what we were looking at is some things that I could find around, uh, around the office. Um, I uh, measured a ruby mounted, a blue sapphire also mounted in a setting, and I had a very small orange sapphire uh, that was loose that I got uh, from, uh, from some uh, colleagues down in uh, Brazil. Um, these are all basically the same uh, mineral. They're all corundum which is uh, aluminum oxide. It is um, second only to uh, diamond in terms of gemstone hardness. Um, it's the elemental impurities that typically give the natural stones their color. So it's interesting to see the, trinder, the trace and minor uh, elements uh, characteristics for these. Okay, this is uh, an overlay of one portion of the spectrum for the three different uh, stones, just to see, give you the, you know, the, the actual input from the, the spectra themselves. So this is just one filter condition, and we're looking at the chrome on up to the gallium. Um, you see uh, in the ruby, uh, you see the, the chrome and the, the strong chrome and the iron peaks. Uh, these are associated with the red color centers for ruby, chrome being the primary one. Iron, I think, is a secondary contributor in this particular case. Um, the orange sapphire, uh, you can see iron and uh, zinc peaks. Um, and I'm not an expert on, on gemstones. I believe this is potentially the color center for the, uh, for the orange sapphire at this particular point. You can see it's very distinct and that it's the only one with a lot of zinc. Um, the blue sapphire, uh, the color center comes from iron and titanium. Um, titanium in this filter condition is not very good, so I collected that under a different filter condition. Um, but you have a very strong iron peak. And then you can see it also, the blue sapphire also has quite a bit of gallium in it uh, in comparison to the other two uh, corundum stones. Okay, so now we want to take uh, all the variety of uh, filter conditions in this particular case. And what I've done here is I have four filter conditions actually that you can see on the left hand side. Um, and you can uh, see in the uh, uh, you can see I've kind of highlighted the color centers and the composition for the different stones. I'm using the SRM 1831 as a calibration standard again, um, and uh, because I, I don't have any 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 particular um, quantified uh, gemstones. Um, but the ruby you can see has very strong levels of chrome and iron that's associated with the color center for ruby. 
you can see the amount of iron in the blue sapphire and the level of titanium that you need to create the blue. I think it's more the absence of chrome in the blue sapphire that you see that is the reason why it's blue as opposed to red. So you can see in the blue sapphire there's almost no chrome uh, at all. There's nothing detectable in that particular case. And in the orange sapphire, you can see the levels of, uh, of the uh, iron and the zinc. Um, the traces that you get for the uh, zinc and the ruby is probably not related to the stone at all. You have to be a little careful when you're, when you're measuring mounted stones because you, you may be penetrating the stone and hitting some of the mount. So the mount is, is typically a, 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 um, a, an al a gold alloy. So you've got uh, copper, nickel, zinc, uh, that kind of thing in, in, the, uh, mounted, uh, in the mounts for these things as well. Um, and the gallium in this particular case is consistent, uh, what's detected there is consistent with what you would see in uh, natural stones. And perhaps an expert could look at some of the quantitative values of these and begin to get some, um, and correlate that also to the origins of where the stones may have been uh, mined. All right, so to, to wrap up, I think, see, we're almost done with the whole hour. Um, anyway, just uh, x-ray is used for, because it's non-destructive. The filtered analysis helps in these cases to remove spectral interferences and give you a good shot at measuring those trace and minor elements that can give you some uh, valuable information. And I hope what I've done here is uh, shown you um, that the, uh, this is applicable not only to just glasses and gemstones, but you can imagine as well geologicals or crystalline metal alloys also are polycrystalline as well. And you're going to be dealing with some of the same kinds of issues. So it's, it's applicable across a broad range of uh, materials. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you for your attention, um, and we'll try to, I, th I think we have a couple of minutes to answer some questions. Um, I will leave it on this particular slide here. These are some uh, upcoming uh, events uh, from uh, EDAX. Um, so I'll leave it on this slide, and I'll take a quick look at the Q&A. Um, yeah, so... Uh, so there's one question here on what is the smallest beam size uh, possible. Um, we were measuring these things with a beam size of around 25 to 30 microns. Um, it's a little bit energy dependent. Uh, the overall beam size um, may go up to about 50 microns at the lower energy elements. Um, this, is, this beam size as well is full with a half maximum. So there's some tailing outside of that range as well. So it's in the region of tens of microns on this particular case. Um, let's see. Um, uh, ordering information for the quantitative software package. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I would suggest um, contacting your uh, local uh, sales representative and refer to this webinar and uh, we can uh, get you some ordering information uh, from there. Um, another question, um, how do we determine the oxygen in the analysis of the glass and the gems? Yeah, this is a, this is a good question. Um, we don't actually detect the oxygen in this situation. We assume that there's a certain ratio for the oxygen and the, uh, the elements uh, that you detect. And so we're doing this by stoichiometry. If we know we have a certain amount of, um, if we know we have a certain amount of element, we know there's got to be a certain amount of oxygen associated with it uh, as well. Um, so uh, the the computational methods take into account that you're saying there's some oxygen in there as well. So bear in mind, uh, keep that in mind when you're doing this calculation. It's the same thing with the boron oxide. You can also calculate boron oxide by uh, this type of a method as well, um, because you're assuming a certain um, you're assuming a certain stoichiometry to the boron for the elements that you've uh, detected. Um, one other question here: um, What were the other peaks in the ruby spectrum that were not labeled? Yeah, that's a, that's a good eye. Uh, there were uh, a couple of other um, peaks in the ruby spectrum that I showed that were not labeled. Um, these, I'm thinking, are coming from the sample mount itself because there was, uh, I think, uh, I looked at this, there was some copper, some nickel, and some gold. So this is, this is characteristic of the, uh, the gold alloy that the uh, stone was mounted in. 
Uh, I think the sapphire was mounted in a different mount, and it was easier just to analyze through the table of the stone and not hit any of the mounting prongs at all. Um, so that was the situation there. Uh, let's see. I think we are pretty much out of time for questions at this particular point. Um, there were a couple more questions in the queue. I will get to those by uh, email um, after, the, uh, after the session has concluded. Um, I want to thank everyone again for your attention, and uh, everyone, please have a good day.